great session. Um, so we will we will have a keynote. If anyone has questions for our speakers, we we will probably reduce the discussion time, uh, so we do have time for a break, uh, and we'll have the rapid fire and make sure that Rich, Dr. Lang has time for his talk and questions. So you can email the speakers with your questions. Um, thank you. So again, we uh, thank the Knights Templar Eye Foundation for support of the key of our keynote lecture series, and I'm very honored to introduce to, to you Dr. Richard Lang. Dr. Lang received his PhD from the University of Melbourne and the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. He had postdoctoral training with Dr. Michael Bishop at the University of California, San Francisco, and has had a strong academic career working in uh, New York and now at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center where he also holds the Emma and Irving Goldman Scholar Endowed Chair. His uh, scientific interests include early eye development, the role of myeloid cells in development, and the effects on the, on the vasculature of the developing eye. And he's won numerous awards. He's earned them, including Research to Prevent Blindness, New Wasserman uh, Merit Award, and the Sackler Lecturer. So I want to uh, have you uh, join me in, in uh, I'm so excited to hear Dr. Lang's talk, and it will be on options four and five in vascular development in the eye and the implications of therapy. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Emmy and everybody else for the invitation to come and speak. Um, I can do it from here. It's been especially interesting for me to hear the clinical perspective on the problems that I'm interested in. I don't often get a chance to come and listen to these kinds of presentations. And so um, you'll find that what I'm going to present is a little bit different. Um, but we'll see whether it raises some interesting discussion points uh, for the uh, clinical operations. So this is just a reminder about where we live. We live on a ball of rock suspended in space. There's a star close by. And what that means is that we are washed with electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation with this rhythmic pattern. Okay, now the availability of photons has been much too interesting a phenomenon for evolution to ignore and so of course we have evolved the visual system in response, we've evolved a circadian system that generates a rhythmic physiology, our circadian clocks are photo entrained, we've also developed what's a much less well characterized seasonal clock um, but what the Lang Lab has been interested in, in the last few years is the question of whether there are other light decoding mechanisms that affect developmental processes. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Okay? So from this very zoomed out view to this very zoomed in view, this is of course a structure that we all care about and one that's evolved in response to the availability of photons. The so Lang Lab for many years has been interested in the mechanisms by which these uh, fetal vascular structures, the pupillary membrane, the tunica vasculosa lentis, and the vasa hyaluridae appropriate or hyaluride vessels undergo a scheduled regression. That's a very interesting developmental timing problem for us. Um, and of course, we view this as an adaptive process because these structures are light scattering. If the regression did not take place, uh, that, would be, that would have a, a negative impact on high acuity vision. Um, and over the years, we've learned quite a lot about the nuts and bolts of the regression process. We know the myeloid cells are essential. We know the Wnt pathways involved. We know the angiopoietin and Wnt pathways are um, integrated in a way that's rather unique. Um, most of the studies we performed actually on the hyaluride vessel system, as I'll show you. But a little while ago, we became interested. You don't know that this is my best site, right? <laughs> So a little while ago, we became very interested in the possibility that a light response pathway 
might be involved in triggering the regression process. I would often get asked the question, how does this process begin? And I had no answers. But we thought about this very carefully and um, considered the possibility that a light response pathway might be involved. After all, it's an eye. It's a structure that's designed to respond to light. Um, and the, what we imagined was that when the mouse was born, that was our primary model, the light level would go up, that would initiate a signaling response, and that would be a great way to time regression of these structures. And that turned out to be a very good thought, um, but it's a lot more complicated than we first imagined. And so this is what we published a few years back now that explains an initial study on how light response pathways regulate vascular development in the eye. And they basically, this pathway basically involves this opsin melanopsin, opium-4, that we know has a number of different functions in the eye. It includes, um, it's involved in circadian entrainment of the suprachiasmatic uh, uh, circadian clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus circadian clock. It's involved in the pupillary light response. This is just another thing that it does. And so through a, a process we really don't understand very much yet, um, stimulation of melanopsin at a certain stage of development actually controls retinal neuron fate, and it actually controls the number of retinal neurons that arise. So what I'm going to tell you is basically that an ROP baby has too many retinal neurons. Okay? That's what you observe in the mouse model. If this, uh, if this opsin, melanopsin, is a loss of function, or you dark rear an animal from uh, late gestation to about a week after birth, you end up with a retina that has too many neurons in it. Cellularity is high. That elevates oxygen demand. You then get elevated levels of VEGFA. Some of that VEGFA remains within the retina, and you get this kind of promiscuous angiogenesis pattern. This is a dark reared animal, and this is P8. Some of the uh, VEGFA makes its way into the vitreous and suppresses regression of the hyaline vessels. Okay, so this was consistent with this whole idea that a light response pathway was important for regulating vascular development in the eye. The real surprise from this project came from data suggesting that the crucial light response window was not after birth as we'd originally imagined, but it was actually before birth. So the data suggested that the crucial light response window is E16 to E17. In other words, photons are traveling through the body wall of the mother, stimulating melanopsin in the fetal eye and eliciting all of these developmental responses. Okay? Now, a lot of my, uh, some of my colleagues have an issue with the idea that photons can travel through tissue. Um, and so I'm going to start with some uh, complicated chemogenetic rescue experiments that address this question. They are a bit complicated, but bear with me. Okay, so the first thing you need to know is that opsins are, of course, G-coupled receptors, and um, melanopsin actually couples through a molecule called GQ. So if you can do a gain-of-function GQ, you can mimic light signaling via melanopsin. Okay, so one of the first experiments we did was ask whether if you delete, if you do a loss of function of GQ in melanopsin-expressing cells, do you get the same phenotype as a melanopsin loss of function? And the answer is that you do. And so this is just a, these are just counts of hyaline vessel, hyaline vessels in various genotypes of animal. Um, and if you do a, this is a flux conditional deletion of GNAQ using opsin 4 cre in other words, restricted to the melanopsin expressing cells. If you do that, you get the persistent hyaline vessel network that's characteristic of dark rearing or melanopsin loss of function. So it's just a way of saying that these cells couple through GQ. It's consistent with that pathway. So having established that, we then had the opportunity to take advantage of these fantastic um, tools that were developed by Brian Roth, the DREDs, or the designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. And they, these are basically engineered GPCRs that allow you to use this unnatural ligand called CNO to activate a particular pathway. And so there's a molecule called HM3DQ that is engineered to activate GQ um, that is available as one of these stop flux alleles. So in other words, you can uh, transcriptionally activate this in a cell of choice. And so we decided to do an experiment where we would activate this HM3DQ stop flux allele using melanopsin Cree. And so of course that restricts the transcriptional activation to the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. And then we could deliver CNO 
as a means of activating that pathway in the absence of either melanopsin or the absence of light. And so it's a rescue experiment. We're asking whether we can replace the activity of melanopsin or the activity of light with this gain-of-function molecule. And I'll show you that you can do that. But the key point about the experimental design is that you deliver CNO before birth. So you're asking whether activation of this pathway before birth is sufficient to elicit all of these developmental responses I've discussed. And so you also arrange the genetics so only the fetal mice can respond and only a proportion of the fetal mice can respond so the experiment can be well controlled. And so this is just an experiment where we've done all of that. Uh, here is a persistent hyaluronic vessel network in a control animal, but in an animal that um, has Cree, opium 4 cre activation of HM3DQ um, has CNO delivered before birth and is also um, op opium 4 loss of function. You actually see that you can restore the hyaluronic vessel number to normal. Okay? And so this is an indication that you can replace melanopsin activity with this gain of function HM3DQ, but only if you activate before birth. The crucial experiment, in my view, is this one, where you can actually simply withdraw the environmental photons. Um, normally what you get is this persistent high load vessel network, but if you active, do this gain of function GQ with CNO injected before birth, you can completely restore the high load vessel number to the normal level. And so this is a nice chemogenetic rescue proof that activation of this melanopsin response pathway before birth is sufficient to give you all of these developmental processes. Okay? Now that's a very long-winded, complicated experiment, right? So fortunately I'm working with this gentleman, David Copenhagen, who's at UCSF, and he's an electrophysiologist, so he can do experiments like I'll show you on the next few slides, where he simply takes a fetal mouse retina and asks whether he can elicit a light-dependent response from melanopsin-positive cells. And this is one example of that kind of experiment. So this is a, what we've done here is put a calcium reporter, GCAMP3, into melanopsin RGCs with opium 4 cre This is another Stopfox allele. And then we've um, stimulated those cells with the appropriate wavelength of light and asked whether we can get a calcium response, and you can, as long as melanopsin is intact. If you do this in a melanopsin loss of function animal, nothing happens. And so this is a, an E16.5 mouse retina that is showing a melanopsin-dependent response. And this is a more recent, recent experiment from David where he's actually done patch clamping uh, for melanopsin RGCs but used different photon flux to try and elicit a response. And so what you can see here is that the latency of the spiking response is longer at lower photon flux. But what's exciting about this is that if you measure the photon flux within the visceral cavity of a pregnant female mouse, you get about this many photons, about 3 by 10 to the 12 photons per centimeter squared per second. And so what David's shown very nicely here is that you can elicit a melanopsin response um, at a physiological photon flux. And so if you put that complicated chemogenetic proof together with this, there's a, uh, you can sort of pretty much be certain now that the, the uh, retina of uh, fetal mice is light responsive in utero. So obviously one of the big questions, um, so well just to summarize there, well obviously what we've shown is that light response could be a normal developmental cue um, and that a developing mammal can respond to light signals in utero. Um, but one of the big questions we face is whether this pathway exists in humans. Uh, and obviously that's a bit more complicated to address, but one of the first questions we had to try and answer was what was the equivalent stage of human fetal development to a, an E16 mouse? One of the ways to do that is just to take advantage of the Carnegie staging that compares uh, surface anatomy of, of different uh, species. And if you use this scale to make the comparison, what you come up with is that an E16 mouse that has a light responsive retina is about equivalent to a, a day 58 human fetus. Okay, so that's the mid, uh, middle of the first trimester. So what we're claiming here is the first trimester uh, human fetus retina is going to be directly light responsive. Uh, and of course, you've heard all about uh, retinopathy of prematurity. This was the obvious disease in which to uh, address this question because many of the vascular changes you see in retinopathy of prematurity are similar to those you see in a melanopsin null or a dark reared animal. 
And so the way we went about doing this, or perhaps more to the point, my colleague Michael Young from CCHMC went about doing this, was a multiple logistic regression analysis in, we, in which we simply asked the question of whether there was any association between average day length over particular periods of gestation and uh, the um, risk of severe retinopathy of prematurity in his particular pool of patients. He gathered five years of patient data um, in which he was able to do this kind of analysis. So obviously what we're doing here is using average day length as a surrogate for light exposure, okay? And this is just a reminder that, you know, we have seasons and the day length varies at different times of the year. And so this was a natural experiment. We had kids who were gestated at different times of the year and we could ask whether there was any association between the average day length and their risk of ROP. And so what we're really asking is whether there's a season of gestation dependent risk of the disease, okay? And so this is one concluding table from that study. Uh, and there are various risk factors that we identified. But here is um, an interesting outcome that average day length over the first 105 days of gestation uh, after conception, in other words, approximately the, fir the um, first trimester, you get a significant association between that and the risk of severe retinopathy of prematurity. Um, this is one of my favorite data comparisons. And this is the chart I showed you originally, which is the chart that allows you to approximate the uh, stage of human development that is equivalent to an E16 mouse based on the Carnegie staging. On the right-hand side here, I'm showing you a chart that actually has, is very dense with data, but it's one that Michael produced, um, where he's actually um, assessed the value of his disease uh, risk model for different windows of time over, uh, from conception. Okay, so he's looking, for example, here, um, from 1 to 30 days, 31 to 61 days, 61, uh, 61 to 90, and so on. And the reason he's, he's done this, of course, is that this represents different trimesters and is, um, uh, represents uh, different phases of this developmental process. And so the area under the receiver operator curve tells you about the value of the model. And so the higher it is, the better the model at predicting disease risk. And this black line down here is the p-value associated with that model. And what you can see here is that for these intermediate intervals, you have a very significant p-value. But as soon as you flip to the second trimester, which is this uh, 121 to 150 time interval, you lose significance. And so this is, a, this is a good day because it's the anatomy and the math telling us exactly the same thing. And this is just another way to look at these data. Um, uh, what Michael's done here is document in th uh, three-month intervals the presentation of a series of patients that need to be assessed uh, for ROP, but then he's uh, represented in the same three-month inter intervals those patients that actually go on to receive treatment. And what you can see is that they're distributed differentially throughout the year. In other words, there is a season of gestation-dependent risk of the disease. And so what we can conclude from that is probably that this pathway does exist in humans. And so what we're saying here is that if you have a, a kid whose first trimester gestation was in the short months of the year, their melanopsin pathway was insufficiently stimulated, they then grow a retina that has too many neurons in it, and they are much more susceptible to hypoxia as a consequence. Okay. Okay, so you, you think that would be complicated enough, uh, but it turns out that there's another option involved in this process. And so what I'll tell you about for the, the second part of the talk here is how this molecule, opsin 5 neuropsin, is involved in regulating vascular development of the eye. And this is all about the hyoid vessels. The, the, this has very little impact on the retinal vasculature as far as we can tell, direct impact on the retinal vasculature. So neuropsin, this is a 380 nanometer violet light sensitive opsin. It is actually expressed within retinal ganglion cells of the eye, as I'll show you, but it's expressed in a whole lot of other places as well. And it raises this really interesting question, which turns out to be true, about whether tissues outside the eye are light responsive due to the expression of this opsin. I won't talk about that today, obviously. But it has all the features of a classical opsin, 
Um, it's been shown to mediate light responses, uh, light responses in a couple of settings. And one I'll mention is that Ethan Bure and Russ van Gelder have shown that Opsin 5 actually runs the circadian clock within the retina. The retina has its own independent photo-entrainable circadian clock. Opsin 5 is the crucial detector for that activity. And so obviously given our interest, we were curious about the possibility that the Opsin 5 null mouse might have a vascular defect, and it does. Um, this is a retinal ganglion cell expressing opsin-5 according to opium-5 pre-brainbow activation. These cells are a distinct subpopulation of retinal ganglion cells from the melanopsin expressing RGCs. And this is the uh, a first account of the vascular phenotype in these animals. Uh, these are highlight vessel preparations that we uh, generate as flat mounts, and we simply count vessels as a means of understanding what its status is. Um, and you can see that at P1, uh, control and an opium-5 null mouse have normal numbers of hyaluronic vessels, but at P8, and this is a stage we typically assess to understand whether there's a persistence or some other phenotype, you actually see that the opium-5 null mouse has fewer vessels than normal. In other words, it has a precocious hyaluronic vessel regression. And this is uh, a unique phenotype. All the other animals that have a highly vessel phenotype have a persistence response. And so this rather suggested that the mechanism of involvement of opium-5 was going to be different from that of opium-4. This is just a nice way to represent the distinction between the opium-4 and the opium-5 phenotype. Here's the persistence over a time course of the opium-4 null phenotype, and here's the precocious regression of the opium-5 null. Uh, we, of course, wanted to assess whether this was uh, a light response um, pathway, and so what we do these days to create light in our mouse rooms is use an array of light-emitting diodes, uh, red, green, blue, and violet, that target the different opsins, and they have the same photon flux as the standard mouse room lights. If you um, create a, a lighting conditions that excludes the violet light that opium 5 responds to, you can actually reproduce the precocious high load vessel regression that is uh, characteristic of the opium 5 null. And so this is an experiment where we actually withdrew the violet light postnatally. And so this makes a pretty strong case that opsin 5 modulation of hyaluronic vessel regression is actually a postnatal activity. And so, of course, this suggests that opium 4 and opium 5 regulation of this process occurs uh, with distinct timing. And I'll come back to that question at the end. Uh, Mintan Nguyen, the, the postdoc who was doing the work on this mouse, had noted that the open 5 null mouse had this unusual expression distribution of tyrosine hydroxylase, an enzyme that's involved in the biosynthesis of dopamine. This uh, pathway, uh, you know, we know dopamine has many important functions in the eye, but this pathway is under feedback regulation, and so this disturbance suggested there might be a modulation of dopamine levels within the eye. And, and uh, that turned out to be the case. And so, for example, if you take... Um, if you just do a short time course postnatally and compare dopamine levels within the vitreous uh, of the mouse eye under normal lighting conditions, LD, or dark rearing, you get elevated dopamine levels, suggesting that light is normally suppressing dopamine levels within the vitreous. And we could also show that in an opium 5 null mouse, you have low levels of dopamine uh, within the neurons of the retina. So this is a lysis to do the uh, uh, dopamine level assessment. But within the, the vitreous fluid, the opium 5 null mouse has an elevated level. And so it's, that's consistent with this dark rearing experiment. Now, the reason this matters for vascular development is the following. And this is a publication from Sinha et al. a while back that uh, showed that dopamine can have a direct effect on vascular endothelial cells through dopamine receptor uh, 2. And what dopamine receptor 2 does is activate a phosphatase called SHIP2, and SHIP2 can dephosphorylate VEGF receptor 2 as a means of inactivating its signaling. And so when we saw these dopamine level data, we wondered whether it was acting as an intermediate and could be an explanation for the precocious regression of the hyaline vessels. And so we tested that possibility, or one of the requirements of that hypothesis was that there was a dopamine receptor expressed in the hyaline vessels. And here is dopamine receptor 2 GFP reporter showing you expression in the vascular endothelial cells of the hyaline vessels. And this is antibody detection of dopamine receptor 2. And indeed, if you do a conditional deletion 
of a dopamine receptor to floxed allele using PDGFB ICRI ERT2, which is a vascular endothelial cell specific uh, CRE activity, you eliminate the immunoreactivity with the antibody. So indeed, there's a very clear signature of dopamine receptor 2 expression in high load vascular endothelial cells. This animal uh, with the conditional DRD2 deletion has a persistent high load vessel network. This is just the count of vessel numbers. And so this is a very clear indication that dopamine has a direct effect on the high load vessels and its normal function is to promote high load vessel regression. And so we could also do this kind of experiment where we asked whether on the background of the open 5 null mouse, which is this high load vessel persistence, would the deletion of dopamine receptor 2 in vascular endothelial cells reverse the consequences? And so you can see that when you do that delete, that conditional deletion, you end up with a persistent high load vessel network again. And so this is a clear indication that these two have opposing functions within this vascular development pathway. And so one of the predictions uh, of this hypothesis was that the activity of VEGF receptor 2 within the hyalate vessels would be um, elevated if you didn't have dopamine receptor 2 present. And so we tested this simply by doing some immunoblots looking at this activating phosphorylation of VEGF receptor 2 in hyalate vessel vascular endothelial cells. And so uh, this is just a short um, serial dilution of the lysate you can get from uh, both a control um, high load vessel and that in which DRD2 has been conditionally deleted. And what you can see is that the level of phosphorylated VEGF2 is elevated in the absence of dopamine receptor 2, and you can quite nicely quantify that here. And so this you know, establishes this proposed mechanism for um, a direct effect of dopamine in uh, promoting high load vessel regression. So this is the model that we've come up with that uh, is designed to help us understand how the melanopsin pathway and the neuropsin opium 5 pathway integrate to regulate vascular development in the eye. So this left side here is what I told you at the very beginning where melanopsin light stimulation actually regulates the number of retinal neurons that arise and that gives you um, hypoxia susceptibility. Uh, gives you elevated uh, VEGF-A if there's either a dark rearing or a loss of function of, of melanopsin. And on the right-hand side here, what we're suggesting is that opium 5 regulates dopamine release to the vitreous, and we know quite a lot about uh, the precise mechanisms, and I won't go into all of that, but it involves this molecule called uh, DAT, or dopamine transporter. That's actually regulated by, by neuropsin activity. And so... Um, that's that explanation. So then we're suggesting that dopamine that makes its way to the vitreous is actually involved in suppressing the signaling acti activation of VEGF receptor 2. And so dopamine has its effect of promoting hyaluronic vessel regression. Now, this occurs at a time in development of the mouse eye when dopamine levels are generally rising. So what you get in the absence of opium 5 uh, is a precocious elevation in the level of dopamine. And so we have this opium 4 and opium 5 regulating these opposing influences on high load vessel regression. And if you work through all those arrows, what you get is that the net effect of opium 5 is actually to sustain the high load vessels. And this is quite interesting. We think this might be an adaptation to get the timing of high load vessel uh, regression right. Obviously, if it regresses too soon, you're going to create hypoxia in the retina. And so we suspect this is an adaptation to ensure that you don't get high load vessel regression until the superficial vasculature of the retina is complete. And so that, that's a way to balance oxygen supply to the retina. Um, and it's actually interesting is that there's an interesting clinical correlate. Dopamine is sometimes used to treat hypotension in premature infants. Uh, and this is, has been shown to elevate the risk of ROP. And probably the explanation is that when you give dopamine, you're uh, prematurely promoting regression of the hyaline vessels and making the retina more susceptible to hypoxia. So, of course, all of this uh, raises this very interesting possibility that you might be able to use these light response pathways as a way to treat ROP. Um, the first component of this, the melanopsin pathway, I've told you that we think this is active as early as the first trimester in humans. 
And so that's going to make it very difficult to take advantage of that in a kid that's born prematurely. Obviously, there's a suggestion that you might take preventative measures. Um, there's a big question now primarily emerging from the circadian biology field that is asking the question of whether living inside under artificial lights is actually detrimental. We obviously evolved outside in sunlight. And so we are understimulated, arguably. And so there's this interesting idea that maybe our physiology is underserved by light stimulation because of the way we choose to live. And so this is relevant to this question as well. Um, in, ensuring that every uh, you know, first trimester pregnant, pregnant woman gets you know, uh, sufficient light stimulation, that's a massive public health problem. I'm not sure I can solve that one, but um, it's a very interesting question to address. But this second pathway that we've identified, OPN5, is a much more interesting prospect because as far as we can tell, it's probably going to be functional in mid to late gestation. And so this, this interesting suggestion that after a premature birth, maybe violet light uh, wavelengths could be used to suppress dopamine and sustain the hyaline vessels. Now, as far as we know, dopamine doesn't have any impact on the retinal vessels. And so this is a way that you would target uh, sustaining of the hyaline vessels as a way of suppressing hypoxia in the retina. So that's a really interesting prospect and worthy of further, further consideration. And so, as I mentioned, the effect of dopamine on uh, vascular, we think, is restricted to the hyaline vessels. Um, and it would probably be wise if we chose to do these kinds of um, uh, studies to deliver light with a circadian rhythmicity, because we know there are other issues if you don't do that. And so uh, the sort of experiment where, the sort of study we're thinking about now can probably be executed in the next few, few years because it turns out we're building a new uh, critical care building at Children's Hospital. And I managed to persuade the architects and the people in charge of that project that we should put spectrally tuned lighting in the NICU rooms. And so this is just an architectural rendering of one of the NICU rooms, but the light fittings are going to be research grade spectrally tuned lighting uh, systems. So in other words, there's a possibility that we could perform this kind of manipulation and ask um, in a, a clinical study whether there are any beneficial consequences. So with that, let me finish and identify the um, people who work with me on this project. Um, there are a number, th this is my fantastic crew, and there are a couple of ringers in here. Some of you will notice that this is Russ van Gelder, and this is Ethan Buer, and Ethan's postdoc, Nico, Diaz, they, they were visiting on this particular day, but I've worked extensively with Russ and Ethan on all of this work. As many of you will know, they uh, worked on um, the non-canonical opsins quite extensively. But uh, these are my lab members who've made a contribution, mm -hmm. and I've had lots of wonderful collaborators on all of this work, including David Copenhagen, Michael Young, Micah Vone, Rashmi Hegde, and I mentioned Ethan and Nico and Russ, and funding from the NIH and the NEI and the Irving Goldman Chair. So with that, I will stop, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Amy. Yes, that was wonderful, beautiful. So I have a question. Um, when you found the, the exuberant vascularity in the retina, in the, uh, I think the melanopsin knockout, right? So did that, did you also look at how much the vessels extended peripherally, and was that increased as well? Um, you do get a slightly accelerated extension of the vessels to the peripheral retina, yes. So that, that would be useful for ROP then? Quite possibly, possibly yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a wonderful work, really, and I'm very surprised about the dopamine on the effects of the fetal vasculature. So do you think it has effects on the PFV formation or uh, can be used uh, during the treatment? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting possibility. I mean, uh, persistent fetal vasculature is a slightly different animal from the changes that I'm showing because there are many other cells associated with those complexes. And so, you know, it would be simple enough to check and see if the dopamine receptor was present. And if it was, then, you know, it would become a real prospect, I think. Yeah.
great study. Have you done any work in like Scandinavia or countries that have such disturbed circadian, you know, their short days? And I mean, that would you would think it might extend, you know, augment the effects you're seeing in like the, someplace closer to the equator. Yes. Yeah, so, so absolutely. Is there a latitude-dependent component of disease risk? And it's actually a question that we um, are currently addressing. Uh, with, with Lois and her collaborators because the data set that they have um, extends to all parts of the planet. And so we expect to be able to understand whether there's any, any latitude dependence to the d disease risk, but it's a great question. I have a basic question about the vascular biology of the hyaloid plexus versus the interretinal ones. Yes. So I, I want to um, understand, in terms of the um, oxygen, um, ret the impact of vascular perfusion on interretinal um, arterial oxygen tension of that particular vascular bed. Right. And I ask in particular, I don't know if you remember, but in 2000, you showed that um, the hyaloid um, retracts by apoptosis, right. whereas we then studied the retina and we couldn't find the apoptosis. We found that the, neighbor, the vascular endothelial cells actually, when they regress, they migrate into the neighboring vascular segments. So I guess from a vascular biologist's point of view, I just want to understand a little bit more about the differences between the biology of the hyaloid plexus versus the interretinal plexus. Right, so um, I mean, there are clear distinctions in the way the retinal uh, plexi are remodeled versus the hyaloid. That's, that's absolutely clear. You know, the idea that you get a remodeling process that involves cell migration within the retina, absolutely, I, I think that's pretty solid now. Um, within the hyaloid vessels, um, it may be, so, you know, apoptosis is certainly one component of the regression process. Is there a migration component? We haven't addressed that directly, and I think, you know, I, I think about those two processes as rather distinct. You know, one is a complete regression of the structure, the other one is a, a remodeling. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, the, those sort of nuts and bolts details have not been our primary interest. We've been interested in, in how you regulate the overall process. So, you know, I, there's still this interesting possibility open, I think. Um, that was so terrific. Thank you very much. And, uh, we would like to present you with a with a gift. Thank you. From a little bit from Utah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And You know, we're going to do the rapid fire, okay? So, yeah, do you want to, is that okay? So we, we are going to have our rapid fire um, presenters for this session. And what we're going to ask people to do is come up to either side, present their, um, their re research for two minutes, and we'll have two-minute discussion question, okay? So, Marco, are you first? 